Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue with verse 251, which reads as follows. Nati raga samo agi, nati dosa samo gaho, nati moha samang jalang, nati tanha samang samo nadi. Which means, there is no fire like passion. There is no grip as tight as anger. There is no net equal to ignorant uh, delusion. There is no river like craving. This verse was taught in response to a story of of five men <clears throat> who the story says came to listen to the Buddha's teaching. And the story makes clear that the Buddha teaches the, out of respect for the Dhamma and he doesn't always concern himself with uh, the audience he teaches out of respect for the Dhamma and, and to lay down the Dhamma <clears throat> even though sometimes the people listening might not understand it so the story goes that these five men came to listen to the Dhamma and Of the five men, the first, the first of them, while he was sitting there listening to the Dhamma, fell asleep. I guess fell asleep sitting up, right in the middle of the Buddha's Dhamma talk. Could you imagine? The second one, while listening to the Dhamma, wasn't really listening. Instead, he was poking at the ground. He was making little doodles in the ground, squiggly lines and <clears throat> etchings into the ground. You know, kind of doodling with his hand. Never seen someone do that when they're sitting. They're clearly not listening. And the third man <clears throat> listening, I guess they were in the forest, but... I guess he got bored because he started. He, he saw this little tree next to him and he started shaking it. He was like shaking this tree. The fourth one, while the Buddha was talking, he watched. He was staring up at the skies. Don't know what he was doing, but spent the whole time just looking up at the stars. And the fifth one sat upright and listened attentively, maybe even with his eyes open, completely absorbed in memorizing and remembering what the Buddha taught. <clears throat> and Ananda was fanning the Buddha. Sometimes they would fan the Buddha for uh, to keep the flies off of him or, or because it was hot maybe. Maybe it was during the day, I don't know. And he noticed these five men, and he was, he watched them, and he saw, and he thought to himself, what what the difference the difference among mortals, among among humans, among beings, worldlings. And he said to the Buddha, he said, it's amazing, you know, here we have this monumentous occasion, the teaching, the preaching of the. Dhamma, by the Lord Buddha himself. The Lord Buddha's teaching is like thunder, it's like a lion's roar. It's like an earth, earthquake, it's such a profound and important event. And yet, only one of these guys was really paying attention. Why were the rest of them 
totally distracted by something else. <clears throat> and the Buddha said, oh, it's because of it's because of people's character and their inclinations. And he said, that one that fell asleep for five for five hundred lifetimes or for for countless many 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 lifetimes every lifetime he was born as a snake and so that's what snakes do when when it cools down i guess when it heats up i don't know curled up in a ball and fell asleep he used to be a snake that's why the second one, when it was digging in the earth, well, for lifetime after lifetime, he was born as a, as an earthworm. And so he's just absorbed in the earth, digging in the earth, I guess. The third one, the one that was shaking the tree, well, lifetime after lifetime, he had been born a monkey. And so his inclination was uh, fixed on the trees. I was just thinking about climbing the tree, maybe, I don't know. The fourth one, the one that was looking up at the skies, well, for lifetime after lifetime, he had been born an astrologer, someone who finds patterns in the stars, and divines people's fortunes from the stars. And so all he could think about was the stars. He was fascinated and absorbed by them. And the fifth one, the fifth one, in many lifetimes he had been born uh, a school of, uh, sorry, a student of the Vedas, a Brahmin student, study student of philosophical texts and religious texts. And so he was well inclined towards studying and, and memorizing and so he was he had this positive quality of attention <clears throat> that he had developed lifetime after lifetime Ananda was amazed and he said well, is it possible that they were just born one thing and the Buddha said oh well it's not even he said it, it, it's not possible to know what they were in every lifetime but guaranteed this is where their minds were. And then he said to Ananda, he said, these, this is the power of these four things. He said, they have the power to overcome and, and uh, override any inclination towards goodness. They have the power to keep one from cultivating good things. Even when the Buddha is sitting right in front of them, they, they can overpower the inclination to listen to his teachings. <clears throat> and then he taught this verse. So the first lesson, the lesson the story gives us is a reminder and a eye-opener as to how lucky and how rare it is to be able to hear and, and appreciate the Buddha's teaching. I mean, it's rare to even have the opportunity to hear the teaching of the Buddha. None of us have it, of course, in this life. We have the rare opportunity to hear and, and study the Buddha's teaching but we've missed the opportunity to hear it from the Buddha himself. But even someone who's able to hear the Buddha's teaching, even someone who's able to study it, uh, gain, gains no benefit from it if they're not inclined towards it, if they're not able to appreciate it. And if they're not in a state where they're able to uh, pay attention <laughs> There are many people, Buddhists even, who appreciate the Buddhist teaching but are unable to pay attention to it. You can see them doing these sorts of things during a Dhamma talk. 
maybe distracted thinking about food or distracted thinking about work, distracted thinking about home, family, many, many different things. Without the lacking, without the la lacking the mental capacity to appreciate it, to understand it, because of various unwholesome inclinations, habits, because of development, cultivation in the wrong direction. So this tells us two things. One, to appreciate the fact that we can, first of all, appreciate the Buddha's teaching. Or that we can understand it and to appreciate the fact that, uh, that, that we have this opportunity and to not waste it or squander it. Because if we develop ourselves in the wrong way, the Buddha's teaching might come around and we might just ignore it. You might just have no capacity to appreciate it. If you can appreciate and understand the teaching now, this is an important opportunity that you have. It's a, it's a, it's a, and it should be an eye opener that we take for granted sometimes our mental capacity to understand things if we're able to. Not realizing that some people will, and it's not just it's not saying we're not saying that they're stupid. I mean, stupidity or or lack of wisdom, you might say, is a part of it. But greed is a part of it. Anger is a part of it. There's so many things. Just being distracted by other things. Many different reasons. If our mind is not, if our wholesome karma is not uh, cultivated in the right direction, we might just come come to the point. We just come to the. Buddha's teaching and, and miss it entirely. There are people for whom this happens, and this could be you if you're not careful. But the second part of it, I think, is that we shouldn't take for granted that we do understand the Buddha's teaching. It's quite common for us to, uh, for, for, for one to uh, uh, believe that because they're listening, because they're attending, because they're studying the Buddha's teaching that they understand it. And one of the big things you learn as a meditator is that you don't really understand the Dhamma when you start. The understanding you thought you had was a very superficial understanding. And you gain a deeper and deeper understanding of the same things through practice. We shouldn't take for granted the intellectual learning that we have. Our capacity to understand things in the, without mental development, intensive mental development, is, is superficial. It's easy to feel complacent and uh, believe that you understand the teachings when in fact you've only scratched the surface. Just a reminder that understanding the Dhamma doesn't just mean listening to it and, and applying yourself. It doesn't just mean attending a Dhamma talk or, or some people you hear about, uh, they'll, they'll turn on the Dhamma talk while they're doing the dishes or well, they're 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 at work, or hmm, well, they're doing something else, which I think is not really the best uh, best idea. The Dhamma is, a, first of all, something that is sacred and something that should be respected. But that's not just a religious idea. It's not just because out of respect, although that is a, a wholesome quality. It's also because it's not easy to understand. If you want to understand, you can't just let the words go into your head and say, I understand the words and the syntax and the grammar. Your mind has to be in the right frame, it has to be in the right state. You have to have a clarity of mind and, and uh, a proper perspective, a mindful a presence in order to understand the Dhamma. And the lesson of the verse is about what exactly the, the things are that keep us from understanding, not just understanding a Dhamma talk, but understanding the truth. Keep us from realizing, appreciating, and understanding the nature of reality. And a reminder of how How, how terrible and how how great the power of these things is. So the Buddha said, there is no fire 
like passion. So ordinarily fires, they burst up and they can consume everything. But they don't really consume everything. They leave behind charred ashes. And when they've taken up their fuel, they burn out. They might rage on for a while, but they burn out eventually. But passion never burns out. It never runs out of fuel, I guess. And it doesn't just burn sometimes. It will flare up at any moment. You can be trying to sleep and your passion flares up. Trying to work. Trying to focus. Passion is something that consumes us. Drives us on. It's why people go into debt. It's why people... Why, why we fight, why we manipulate, why we compete. It leads to ambition, it leads to violence. It leads to cruelty. It leads to miserliness and stinginess. It flames on and it inflames the mind. Most importantly, it's like a fire that um, consumes our ability to see clearly. Until the fire of passion dies down, you can't really understand the truth. You can't really understand the truth of, of your own situation. You'll be blinded by passion. Passion blinds us to the suffering that we cause by chasing after the things we're passionate about. If you're passionate about something, you, you don't care who you're hurting other people or hurting yourself. You can make yourself sick because of your passion, because of lust, because of desire. You look at a drug addict, that's what happens to them, but it's not limited only to drug addicts. Meditation helps us see the danger. It helps us see this inflamed state. It see the 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 obstruction that passion and passion is for us. It's like the greatest fire leaves nothing behind. There is no grip like anger. So the commentary compares the grips of a of a monster, or the grip of a wild animal, maybe. Someone can grab you, can hold you, can pin you down, keep you from doing the many things that you'd like to be doing. They can even drag you away in a direction you don't want to go. But none of those grips are like the grip of anger. Anger seizes us. Anger causes us to do and say things that are completely against our own benefit and the benefit of others. It, it blinds us. It drives us like a slave driver. People who have anger issues will tell you they didn't mean to, they didn't want to hurt others, but the anger just blinds you. You just fly into a rage. No, Anger makes you reckless. Anger seizes you. People who are who are habitually angry also become habitually unhealthy. They don't take care of their their bodies, and their their bodies start to heat up. You know, their physical, even their physical form, becomes unhealthy through anger. Anger is like a great sickness. It causes you to hurt yourself and hurt others. It's a very fearsome sort of thing, something that we should be terrified of. Our own anger. Anger is so it causes you to say things, causes you to do things. You have the best of intentions, but when anger comes, it's just you're like another person, like a, a, a Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing. Number three, Nati Moha. Samang Jalang. There is no net like delusion. 
This is a reference to the Brahma Jala, I think, but it shows the, the, the meaning of the word Brahma Jala, that the net of delusion extends through the whole universe. Most nets, if you wriggle around, you might actually escape from them. And if you, are, if you avoid them, you can find a way to just not get caught up in the net. The person hunting birds will throw a net. Some of the birds get caught, some of them don't. But the, the Brahma Jala, the, 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 the net of samsara catches even Brahma. You can go anywhere in samsara, you won't escape delusion. Meaning, there's no path you can take that will free you because of delusion. You, you can't become free by going to the Brahma realm because the Brahma still has delusion. Greed, anger, a Brahma doesn't have any of these, but a Brahma still has delusion. They still can have wrong view, they still can have conceit, ignorance, they still have ignorance. Many religious paths focus on, spiritual paths focus on endeavor, Cultivating meditative practices, spiritual practices, based on effort, based on concentration, focusing the mind, calming the mind. And they'll never escape that way. The net still catches you. The only way to escape the net is wisdom. Overcoming ignorance, straightening one's delusion, you know, correcting one's delusions, one's wrong views, one's conceits, one's self-identity and so on only by discarding all of these can one cast off the net of delusion delusion is the net that covers greed and anger rely on delusion without delusion there can be no greed no anger without ignorance there can be no suffering avijja pachaya avijja ignorance is the beginning it's the net that we're trying to escape. So it's quite meditation in that sense is quite simple. It's not about fixing our our greed and problems, our anger problems. It's about fixing our delusion problems, basically fixing our ignorance problems. It's about understanding. It's a very simple concept. And finally, Nati Tanha Samanadi. Tanha, there is no river like craving. So tanha is more broad, I think, than raga. Raga is maybe a specific type, but ra raga is its own, uh, has its specific idea. Tanha is any sort of clinging, any sort of uh, flowing, really, like the asava, like a river. Any kind of inclination we have, desire for anything any ambition, any clinging to anything, really. The, the analogy of, or the, the, the imagery of a river is quite apt. Samsara or life, existence is like a river flowing on. But tanna is like the clinging to something in the river. It just makes no sense in the end because life continues on. Life goes on and on. An enlightened being is so much, so at peace, even alive, even though they still suffer from physical maladies, from uh, from being accosted by people and 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 insects and and the elements and old age, sickness, death. But they live in such peace because they go with the river. But the river of craving here is 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 something different from that. The river of craving, because craving never ends. It never dries up, just like the fire of passion. Most rivers, if you've ever been to one of the big rivers in India, the river where the Buddha cut off his hair and crossed the river and went to the Bodhi tree, that river dries up most of the year, or much of the year, it's, it's mostly dried up. So sometimes it floods, sometimes it dries, but the river of craving never dries up. You can't just wait for for your craving to dry up, thinking it's okay if I 
cling to this or cling to that. Eventually I'll have enough. You know? Once you've had enough, there's never enough for craving. Craving never has enough. It's habitual, in fact. The more you incline towards something, the more you want it. So there is no river like craving. The lesson for us as meditators is, well, besides the lessons of remembering the, the great opportunity we have and appreciating the need for a depth of understanding that can't be found just in texts, I think it it helps us to focus our attention on what is really important, reminding us that our progress in, in the practice really comes down to our freeing ourselves from these things, from passion, from anger, from delusion, from all the many forms that these take. You know, we can... We can uh, have the delusion, be under the delusion that these things are good. We can be angry when people suggest that we give up the things we crave or, or cling to. And we're completely ignorant about the, the problem and the danger, even ignorant about the existence of these things in ourselves. Part of our meditation practice is a big part of it, is just coming to see what's inside, coming to see that we have these things see that we have them, see the nature of them. Just really to see the, the chaos and the, the inconsistency in our minds, there's no, that there's no rhyme or reason to these things. There's no reason to get angry. There's no reason to cling. There's no reason to believe. There's no validity to our beliefs and so on. So you don't have to actually fix any of these things. You just see that they're they're meaningless and useless. They're a waste of time, a waste of effort. They're embarrassing, really. You realize how embarrassing it is to get caught up in things that are so useless. Well, you see that they are, they are without value, and you let them go naturally. So a good verse, one of those important verses that boldly claims... What is, what is the essence of spiritual religious life and the essence of the goal of, of existence. So that's the Dhammapada for today. Thank you for listening.